This video is going to cover geometry and the nearest neighbors algorithm. So far, we've been talking about data in terms of features. This suggests a geometric view. Each feature can be considered a dimension in some space, and each sample can be a point in that space. Features have no meaning to a computer. Features must be quantified in some way in order for the computer to do anything with them. If you tell a computer that something is blue, it isn't even really capable of storing that information unless you quantify it in some way. We do this with feature values. Data then turns into feature vectors, and a sample is represented by its feature vector. Binary features are yes or no. They can correspond to whatever feature values we want. We can choose zero or one, negative one and one, or cat and dog. It's really up to us. Typically, they're represented by negative one and one, or zero and one. Categorical features need to be translated to values as well. If we have color features like this, blue, red, green, and yellow, we could represent these as numbers, right? If we use 0, 1, 2, and 3 to represent them, that could work. But if we do that, then we're saying that blue is closer to red than it is to green. But this isn't something that we really want to say. The solution to this is to create four features from one. So we decided this is not a good idea. And what we do instead is we create four features from one and we create binary indicator features. So now we have four binary features. Is blue, is red, is green, and is yellow. And each one of the dimensions here is represented by that. So is blue is true here and false for all the other ones, right? Is blue is false here, but is red is true. Is blue, is red, both false. Is green is true. And then similarly here, we have all zeros except for the is yellow. So now instead of having one feature that represents blue, red, green, and yellow, we have one feature for each. And we represent this as a vector. Real valued data goes to real valued features. So real valued features can be represented as is. Each feature can be represented using its real value and each sample can be represented as a vector of real values. Binary data goes to 0, 1, or negative 1, 1 features, and categorical data becomes binary indicator features. Samples are now represented in feature space. So we have a sample x, which is a vector, and it has different features. And so it's represented by a vector of all those features together in some d-dimensional space where there are d features. That's all this fancy math means. So this is just a vector symbol. This is just the individual features combined into a vector. And it's just saying that this vector is in d-dimensional space because there are d elements. So when we're talking about feature dimensionality in machine learning, it's important to kind of talk about what large means, what small means, right? So what is low dimensional and what is high dimensional in this space? So typically when we're not doing distance learning, I um, ask this question, pose it, and I get answers like, okay, well, what's high dimensional? And I'll get students saying, oh, 100, 1,000, you know, so on. So low dimensional is something that's probably like under 100, and high dimensional is usually in the tens of thousands all the way up to millions. So the dimensions can get really high uh, when there's a lot of data that you're dealing with. So again, we're gonna be treating data as features in space. So now we have all these samples and they're represented by these feature values and this is the feature vector, okay? So as features in space, we can actually plot these. So this is two dimensional, okay? So we can actually plot them. And if we're trying to predict male versus female, then our label would be this gender column and we would use red, and blue in this case, because that's what I chose to represent these graphically. So if I have all that data in feature space and I'm just trying to figure out, okay, well, I have this new sample 
and the height is 62 inches and the weight is 125 pounds. Do I think it's a male or a female? Your initial reaction would probably be that it's a female because it kind of fits along with all these other samples of females and it's pretty far away from the weight and the height of the males. Well, this is a reasonable assumption. So if we actually take that unknown point and plot it here, it's in green. We can see, okay, well, it's much closer to the female samples than it is to the male samples. That is the nearest neighbor algorithm in essence. That's the whole thing. And the inductive bias of this is just that nearest is best, right? So that an unknown sample should be, should have a similar label to samples that are nearby it, okay? And it actually works well. So this is a very simplistic algorithm and it works really well and it's actually used for a lot of different things. What we're gonna learn about in this class is the K nearest neighbor algorithm. So we take K neighbors and we've let them vote towards a final decision for a test point. So let's look at the data that we were just looking at and we have this unknown point. We have all the blue points which are female and all the red points which are male. And we look at this and we say, okay, what if we're looking at our nearest neighbor? Okay, so if we look at the nearest neighbor, it's gonna be this one, which is labeled as female. So we'll say, okay, this is a female sample. If we use K equals two, we'll look at these two samples and we'll let them both vote. So this one votes for female, this one also votes for female. We're good to go. Output is female. For K equals three, we're going to look at the three nearest neighbors, which is this one, this one, and this one. All three of the neighbors are labeled with female. And so they're all going to vote for female and our unknown point is gonna be predicted as female. That's it. The algorithm is very simple. Now let's go through the steps a little bit more formally. And so let's define a couple things first. The training data is going to be called D. So that's just gonna be a set that has all the training data in it. N is gonna be the number of training samples. And the training samples look like this where we have a feature vector and a label, a feature vector and a label, and so on. This is gonna be our empty list, and our test sample is gonna be represented by x hat, and the prediction that we make on x hat is going to be y hat. Here's the algorithm, it's just three steps, very simple. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our test point and we're gonna find the distance from that point to all points in the data set. Okay, in the training data. And that's gonna give us n distances and we'll store them in some vector lowercase d. Okay, then we're gonna sort all of the points in the training data by their distances away from the test point. Okay, so we'll get closest to farthest. And then we're going to predict based on the sign of the sum of the labels of the smallest distance points, okay? So we're gonna keep talking about this and I'll show you how this works. But basically we're going to take the top K closest points and we're gonna sum up their labels. And that's gonna give us our label to predict, okay? The labels in this case are not zero, one, they are negative one, positive one. And so when you sum them up, you get a prediction. So imagine if you had three points Two of them were positive and one of them was negative. If you add them together, it's positive one. You take the sign of that and it's positive. So you predict a positive label for that test point. So finding the distance from the test point to all training points is gonna be a Euclidean distance, okay? We've talked about that a lot. Then we just sort, like I said, and then we calculate the predicted label. And remember the labels are negative one or positive one. So doing this operation is just the voting and it results in a predicted label. So again, if we have an example where we have two negatives and one positive, we take the sign of the sum and the sum is negative one, then we get negative and we predict a negative label. Here's another example. We sum these up, we get positive three. The sign of positive three is positive, and we predict positive. So in English, we're finding the distance from every training sample to the test sample. 
And then we're sorting the training samples from largest to smallest distance. Oh, smallest to largest distance to the test sample. And then we're assigning the majority label of the k-nearest neighbors to the test sample. How do we choose k? If k equals 1, it always predicts the class of the nearest neighbor. That's not always great, and you're not really taking a lot of information into account. This is overfitting. If k equals n, we're always predicting the majority class. This is underfitting. If k equals 2, we can run into issues when we have a point that's equidistant from a positive and a negative sample. So if we had an unknown point right here, it would be equally far away from a female point and equally far away from a male point. And so how would we make our prediction? How would you do any kind of tie breaking? So when you have an even k, you're putting yourself in a position to have to do tie breaking randomly and that's not a good position to be in. So k is a hyperparameter. This is something that the programmer has to choose. Usually we'll choose it based on some held out set of data so we'll use the validation data to decide what to use for k. The limitations of KNN are a lot but it still works really well. So the inductive bias is that the nearest is best, which isn't always appropriate if all the features aren't equally important. So because it takes a geometric view, it plots every point. And so it treats every single feature as equal. And that just might not be true. So you might have some features that are completely unimportant, but they get just as much weight as everything else. And so that can be a problem. It can't determine which features are important, so it uses everything. Um, what I like to say is that the k-nearest neighbor loves garbage, so if you feed it in garbage, you will get garbage out. So if there are many not useful features, the k-nearest neighbor's algorithm will perform poorly. What's cool about k-nearest neighbors is there's no model. Um, so all you're doing is taking test points and comparing them to the training data. It's cool and also not cool uh, because you have to hold on to the training data all the time. So if you're always holding on to the training data, then you have issues of space. And it also takes a long time to compare every test point with every training point. So that can be kind of an issue depending on what you're trying to use it for. That's it for k-nearest neighbors. It's a really simple algorithm. So. The next topic is going to be clustering.